Dzień dobry Państwu, witam Państwa bardzo serdecznie na kolejnym z wykładów w Instytucie Studiów Zaawansowanych. Dziś naszym gościem jest Pan Profesor Ashamin z Uniwersytetu Cambridge. Nasz wykład odbywa się w ramach seminarium Pana Profesora Jerzego Hausnera, który też poprowadzi dzisiejsze spotkanie i dyskusję po wykładzie Pana Profesora Amina. A ja tylko chciałbym jeszcze przypomnieć, że jutro, w, jutro odbędzie się wykład pani profesor Susan Buck Morse i dyskusja z udziałem profesor Gaty Billy Cropson oraz Adama Lipszyca. A tymczasem oddaję głos panu profesorowi Jerzemu Hausnerowi. Dzień dobry państwu. We know each other since mid 90s. Uh, we work together in the European Association for Evolutionary Political Economics. One of the uh, books in our, in, 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 in our academic life is co-edited books coming from the conference organized in Krakow. So I, would, I'm, I have a real pleasure to introduce to you my friend, Professor Asha Min. Ash is a chair of geography and fellow of Christ uh, College of the University of Cambridge. Uh, but uh, he was graduated uh, at the University of, of, of Reading. And also he received his PhD at the same university. Then he started his academic career in the Newcastle University. When we were uh, cooperating together, I will, you were moving from Newcastle to Jarem when I visited you a couple of, uh, of time. Uh, Ash established uh, at the University of Durham Institute of Advanced Study, uh, Studies, then he moved to, to Cambridge. There are a lot uh, to be said on his research uh, activities. Uh, he's a renowned specialist in such areas as living uh, uh, cities and regions, uh, also, uh, he's uh, a specialist in social economy with a special reference to the architecture of the social economy in, in, in Great Britain. And what uh, is really uh, very interesting for me, he's also a specialist in the area of economy, uh, and, uh, in the area of economy understood as cultural entity. So the subject is very near to the seminar I run uh, in the Institute. Uh, Ash uh, chose for the topic of his lecture uh, something what is uh, connected to his uh, very fresh book, co-authored co with uh, Nigel Frith, his long, long uh, colleague. Uh, the book uh, has the title Arts of Political, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Do I need to use it? Uh, can you hear me? I need to use it? OK. Uh, well, <clears throat> you, yes, you thank you very much for your invitation and your kind words. It is actually true. We are old friends. So it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, and uh, I'm really pleased that I'm in this institute, not, not only because I also established an institute of advanced study in another university but it seems to me that this place is actually more interesting because of its connections in civil society and beyond uh, the academic intelligentsia. So um, it's, it's a great honor for me to be here, and uh, thank you for coming to listen to me. Um, I had written a text, so I'll, I'll use the text if you don't mind, um, but I'll, I'll pretend as though I'm not reading, so <laughs> at least I can make this more lively than just reading something. So I'd like to uh, just begin with an observation that the global protests of the last two years against dictatorship, against market society, and against the steady erosion of democracy, however you define it, in different parts of the world, it seems to me have separated the political which you could define as the territory of public disputation, 
and claims making from politics, which we would, I would define as the arena of, let's call them the settled rules of conduct. So, for example, the insurrections of the Arab Spring and those in Ukraine now, the insurrections, or um, you wouldn't call them insurrections, but protests in the streets of uh, the cities of Brazil, today in Venezuela as well, the occupations of public space in Turkey, in Istanbul last summer, and also in, in a number of capitalist cities in defense of what we would call the commons, the urban commons, the public commons, the protests everywhere against the financial crisis. I see you've translated Paul Mason's book, It's Kicking Off Everywhere. All the protests in Greece against austerity and also the remaking of Europe. All these um, things that are going on in our world at this particular moment in time, you know, when democracy has been so settled but also so abused, is a very interesting political period. And I think that these protests that we are seeing, including the ones around the world with experiments in direct democracy, have opened up the political in really quite remarkable ways. What have they done? They've introduced new tactics, new claims, and popular desire uh, for a future that is radically different from the authoritarian and the non-authoritarian present. Now what's interesting is that where politics, as we know it, has survived, if it has survived, representative politics, top-down politics, politics which has been married to fixed procedures and agendas, it's very interesting that the only response of politics as we know it has been to, to reinforce its own methods and its own ambitions. And this is what I mean by this steady divorce, separation of politics from the political. So politics as we know it, wherever we look in the world, has looked neither to, to harness the potential of grassroots organization, nor to imagining the future as any different from the present. But perhaps the only response of politics as we know it has been to adjust at the margins, by and large, to kill off dissent, to, to tame protest. So it seems to me that the more the theater of the political expands, okay, the more the theater of the terrain of public disputation expands, the more the theater of politics as a set of embedded institutional practices closes down. And in the liberal democracies, which is by and large the focus of my talk today, representative politics even that on the left seems to envision no alternative to market society, to individualism, today to the austerity and to discipline, um, and to rule by experts and expertise. While in contrast, in the mature or the fragile authoritarian states, any opening for a popular franchise is quickly shut down by totalitarian regrouping. So whichever side of the world you're on, the authoritarian side or in the liberal democracy, the response of the status quo has been to maintain the status quo. So in, in the arena, in the realm of known politics, there reigns, there is ever-present a shared diagnosis of the future as parsimonious, a future that needs to be shared out very carefully, that offers very few rewards in the context of austerity, and that is simultaneously a future that is threatening. 
So this is quite different from the post-war consensus in which the future was seen as both hopeful and plentiful coming out of the, the war, at, le at least in, in, in Europe. Whereas now there's a kind of diagnos di di diagnostic of the future as both apocalyptic, cat catastrophist, and at the same time parsimonious, okay? uh, a place of scarce resources and scarce rewards. And so in, in, through this analysis of the future, defined in these two ways, the arena of politics as we know it sees, sees this future as incompatible, as inconsistent um, with the society of universal well-being, with the society of distributed rather than centralized authority, and with the society of equality made widespread. You could call these the kind of canonical principles of the social demo democratic and socialist consensus after the war in, in, in Europe. And all these things, because the future is seen as catastrophist, are essentially considered by the political classes and those who wish to maintain the status quo as an unaffordable luxury. And so the legacy of, so of social democracy, I think because the future is diagnosed in this particular way, it, within the political arena, the, 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 um, the, uh, the ideals and the victories of social democracy are effectively seen as an unaffordable luxury. No nostalgia. The, nost the past cannot, is not a space we can return to. And interestingly here, anything that questions the givens of political practice, whether it's the occupation of Tahir Square or the Occupy movement itself, or even uh, any form of kind of critique and dissident politics, what this institution uh, represents, um, are judged to be at best a distraction from the big affairs of the status quo, or at worst, dangerous. So what I find really interesting, and I'm, this is not my observation, but it's been made by a lot of people, um, history in the making at the moment around the world is being forced, like sand in an egg timer, through the structures and the strictures, the closures, of tried and tested political forms. And this history that doesn't quite go through the egg timer or finds it difficult to go through the egg timer is framed as out of order, as anomalous. And who is doing this framing except other than a very powerful coalition of vested interests that include the big parties, political parties, uh, the corporate world, uh, established bureaucracy, the media, of course, and interestingly, sometimes also, depending on where you are, established civic and religious organizations. So it's almost as though the major re repre representative organizations of the status quo effectively uh, poses, is, is at the vanguard of this closure of those things that will not go through comfortably through the egg timer. So if the terrain of struggle itself is becoming much more plural, more autonomous, and counter-hegemonic, as we see today everywhere in the world, this is not how it appears by and large in public understanding, and certainly not in mainstream political understanding. And if the tools are becoming the tools of critique of dissent, of protest, are becoming more and more hybrid, where there is real political opening of the instruments of politics, this is not how the establishment wants it. Now, ironically, and this is a controversial statement, the separation of politics from the political often m meets the approval of those wanting history to look different from the status quo. It often meets the approval 
of, if you like, people who are actively involved in street level politics. Um, in the belief that the more agitation or the more agitation we have, this can only weaken an authoritarian order that is considered to be, is, is considered by uh, the enemies of the status quo as an authoritarian order that stands on its last legs. That more street level anti-establishment politics, it is said, will only serve to bring the old order down, to thicken horizontal politics, and legitimate the, the plural and the communitarian future in the making. Okay. What I'm saying to a degree is that those on this, if you like, at street level, effectively say, that's okay. okay? This kind of a politics is, will, will serve us well, will serve history quite well. My own position is that I'm very far from convinced that the old order, at least in the liberal democracies, is on its last legs, uh, ready to concede, and eviscerated. I don't think the old order is anywhere near um, disempowered as its critics seem to imply or seem to claim. In fact, I think exactly the opposite is true. The old order is very much in control of the distribution of well-being. It's very much in control, by and large, in the formation of public opinion and public desire. And it's very much in control in framing the future, or ready to pounce back, as we have seen in Egypt, and possibly we will see in eastern Ukraine as well. So I am not sure that the autonomist movements, let's call them that for the moment, uh, are able to deliver the just and the equal society um, without large-scale advocacy or large-scale support from the world of politics itself. So this is just about the most controversial um, statement I will make. But, but nevertheless, whatever my opinion on what's going on on the ground, what I think is extraordinarily striking is that am amidst the developments of the last two years, the organized left, certainly in the liberal democracies, has not been moved at all by the dissent at home. By the organized, I, I mean established parties of the left that seek to be in government, I mean the, the labor movement, I mean historic, historic organizations that have come out of a kind of tradition of left-wing militancy and now in one shape or form, have coveted or sought power. The organized left, um, and this is a real paradox in many ways, has kept away from grassroots developments. It has seen them as marginal. Uh, the British Labour Party is, is extremely, uh, a, a, an extremely good example of this. It has seen them as misplaced, and even at a time when the, the, the main institutions of the organized left, political parties, unions, and historic social movements, have been reduced to the electoral and the ideological margin. This is what I mean by the paradox. The left refuses to align itself with what's, if you like, the beauties of what's going on on the street, at precisely at the time when, in fact, its historic mission seems to have failed. So instead, the, the historic left, either because it is locked in tradition or it is locked in timidity, and because it is obsessed with the middle ground of consumer and media culture, which in any case has become thoroughly captured by the right, which is why I see, you know, why... Uh, Kritika Politička is such an important force in the context of Poland. In all these circumstances, the organized left sees that the only course of action is one that must be premised on the preservation 
of the status quo. So agitation and a politics of social transformation, any explicit commitment to the just and the equal society, any repulsion of or critique of embedded power are nowhere to be seen within the organized left. At least the world that I know in Western Europe. Instead, all we see from the established left is electoral appeasement, okay, responding to the latest opinion polls, playing the game of electric, electoral politics in the most slavish of ways. Um, all we see from the left is increasingly the pursuit of power for its own sake and very tepid, lukewarm defense of anything that we might wish to call redis redistributive capitalism, let alone a politics of social transformation. Or if not this explicit rejection of its historic mission as a force of social transformation, the established left offers a vague, vague promise that once in power, it will return to the politics of transformation. Let us get into power first, thinks the established left, before we can become redistributive, social democratic, and, f and wave the flag of equality and social justice. But in the meantime, it seems to me what happens, and this is kind of one of the significant main points I wish to make, the historic left, by behaving in this way, fails to convince. Or, when it comes into power, on the rare occasions these days that it does get electoral power, it then fails to change course. So, the left, the historic left, the official left, to me seems to be stuck between a rock and a hard place. By, in a sense, not wishing to become involved in the politics of social transformation. Of course, the question that you could ask is, does this invisibility of the established left matter? Does it matter that the established left no longer can be seen as a force of social transformation? I've, al I've already said a few minutes ago, for many of the protagonists of agitation politics, people who are involved in Occupy, for instance, uh, it doesn't matter. Why? Because partly it is felt that any kind of top-down politics is suspected because it is top-down. Or, in, more interestingly, because it is felt that agitation will eventually lead to change. That there is a kind of unstoppable momentum here. Which is kind of half of the argument that you find in, in Paul Mason's book. It's certainly all of the argument that you find in David Harvey's book on, on, uh, on rebel cities. And I want to offer a different argument in the, in the rest of the time that I have this afternoon. I want to argue that without the involvement of an organized left that is able to amplify cause and that is able to deliver tangible reforms, the chances of a politics of agitation will, become ex will remain extremely precarious. The many openings, substantive, and, um, and, and instrumental of the counterculture will find no traction, will find no tangible grip. The organized, and as a consequence, I think the organized power of the right will remain unopposed, uh, unopposed, bureaucratically at least, and politically in terms of tangible reforms. And I think, I fear to say the objects of struggle what are the objects of grassroots leftist struggle at the moment? Such things as the minimum wage, universal welfare, the, the struggle for decent and affordable housing, the right to belong, particularly if you're an immigrant or an ethnic minority, the struggle for cultural autonomy um, in uh, mixed nations and mixed cities. All these things, um, I think, in the end, will stay out of the legislative and out of the institutional structure. Um, left, abandoned to the ups and downs 
of continual agitation, which is a game of chance in many ways, I think. But to say this, I don't think, and here I come to my thesis, I don't think this is a simple matter of an unchanged official or organized left throwing its weight behind the developments of the last two years. So what I've said so far is that I think the official, without the involvement of the official left, no matter how much we like it or not, history in the making will go in strange directions. But I'm also saying that it's not an unchanged official left that's, require, that's required in order to face the future. Instead, as Nigel Thrift and I propose in our recent book, Arts of the Political, um, and I, Professor Hausner has a, has a copy of it now, our argument is that the left needs to engage with the new political developments in order to alter the ground of politics itself. So that the status quo and those who defend the status quo begin to appear inadequate, begin to appear outside of the march of history, begin to appear as counter-historical. My argument is that the left, the official left, needs to once again become a world-making force. At the head, the protagonist of new desires, of new causes, and new political arts. In short, what I want to argue is that the left needs to reinvent itself thoroughly, root and branch, and operate beyond the constraints of the givens of representative politics in the, in, in, in the neoliberal democracies. If only to free the representative politics to free it from the modalities and the interests that today, after 20, 30 years of neoliberalism, have come to serve the interests of the few in the name of the many. Now, of course, I can hear you ask, or if you are not asking, let me say it. This might be, of course, to come close to asking the impossible of the organized left. But let's consider the prospect that without such a renewal of the left, the organized or official left itself thoroughly reinventing itself, the left in any case then will wither away. It will die. It will disappear. But more positively, let us also recall that at various turning points in history, in modern history, um, the late 19th century in Europe, the immediate post-war in Western Europe as well, the anti-colonial struggle in the 50s and the 60s around the world, in pivotal moments um, in the struggle against dictatorship and oppression in different parts of the world, whether it's Eastern Europe or Latin America or in Africa, let us remember that during these historically interesting moments which became turning points, because they were made to become turning points, this is exactly how the left gained force and traction. Traction as in uh, grip and momentum. And how the left went about at the time of its own birth, or the, at least the European left, in the late 19th century, provides some very interesting clues for the future, in my view. And, and this is what I want to turn to now. Just a couple of historical examples. The years between 1880 and 1914, before the First World War, in Europe are tellingly clear about how a new political force managed to convert agitation into radical reform. In many instances, tangible radical reform through a complete 
overhaul, a complete transformation of the very ground of politics. Okay? So the, the political reinvented politics in the late 19th century in Europe. That's what I want to try and show and argue now. So these are 20 to 25 years after, after 1880 were a remarkable period in the history of, um, let's call it the, kind of the forces of social transformation in, in Europe. This was a period when against the grain of generalized misery today, against the grain of generalized oppression and political closure today, against the grain of so many things that are very similar to today, both the reformist and the revolutionary left actually came into being as a political force. <clears throat> Managing to change both hearts and minds as well as secure lasting material and institutional gains. Many, many were the transformational struggles and achievements of that time, 100 years ago, from the rise of the labor movement itself, the rise of socialist, social democratic, or pragmatist in, 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 in the American 20s, of pragmatist diagrams of well-being and community. It was a time of amazing campaigns for alternative lifestyles, such as vegetarianism. Did you know that? I didn't know that until I did the research. Uh, campaigns for the great outdoors, for the urban industrial working, working classes, this campaign of taking people out into the healthy outdoors, and a great campaigns for new meanings of community. Um, uh, I immense campaigns for sexual liberation, uh, not, not in the 60s, but in the, 18, in the 1880s and 1914 period. And of course, the first stirrings of agitation against um, imperialist colonization, which is the turn of the last century. By, by any measure, by any account, that was a period of extraordinary mass mobilization and political inventiveness precisely at a time when one felt that the grain of history was for the status quo. Uh, of course, the institutions of the status quo were fragile at the time, as you could say they are today. But nonetheless, out of the kind of the fragility of things, the kind of mass politics of mobilization for a new kind of world, for a new way of being in the world, emerged. And let me just dwell very briefly on, on, on two examples. Now, the first example might be described as a, a politics of a new utopia made tangible, brought to the ground. Um, and in the book, I, call, we, I, I refer to it as the pragmatic Marxism of the German Socialist Party, the SPD. Uh, this is a very well-known history, so I, there's no point in me going into the detail of this history, but I just want to bring out one or two significant issues, which I think speak to the kind of argument that I wish to make. The SPD is formed in 1875 amidst considerable uncertainty about its direction and its reach led by the two towering figures of August Bebel and Kautsky, the party quickly rose to dominate the European socialist movement, extraordinarily quickly. But very importantly, it also developed a significant presence in, in Germany. Um, already by 1912, so that's some 30 or 40 years after it's created, it gets 35% of the vote in the Reichstag. The well-known factors behind the SPD's success at a time of open argument between emerging industrial interests, declining aristocratic power, the fracture of Bismarckian authority, and highly, highly differentiated and divided mass concerns, not just between town and country, but, almost every, but, but, but between all the regions um, in Germany. We know 
that these are all these kind of well-known factors which allow an SPD, a new political force, to come into being. Um, and we know also that one of the reasons why the SPD comes to the fore as opposed to any other kind of left-wing political force is, part, is partly the power of ideology, strong leadership, organized discipline. But I want to argue that there was much more. There was much more at work in explaining why the SPD came to dominate European socialist thought and practice and German politics too. I think it had something to do with the, the role of the SPT, SPD in redefining the subjectivity of the future, the subject of the future, and completely redefining the tools of political engagement. So what do I mean by this? Firstly, the SPD managed to project a radically different future around a very small and emerging industrial proletariat. And it managed to project the interests of this very tiny, tiny industrial proletariat at that time in Germany as a credible future for everybody. These first socialists invented, and I mean quite literally the word invented, as Donald Sassoon has argued, a new political subject and a vanguard actor, the working class, and the new model worker. And it managed to invent this figure of the future out of a poor, desperate, fragmented, and downtrodden working mass. Now, if you think back to this time, and we, have the, we only have the benefit of hindsight here, this was an extraordinary political invention for, for that time, made, which was then made tangible, secondly, by, by the ability of the SPD and the, the then free unions, as they were called, to win significant practical reforms at the time, not 10 years later, not 20 years later, but during that time, particularly when the SPD goes into the Reichstag. For example, it managed to win concrete reforms around better wages, better working conditions, and welfare protections for members, particularly when they went on strike. Thirdly, the SPD somehow was able to clothe the movement with what the Australian socialist leader of the time, Julius Brauntal, put it, with the beauty of a thousand stars. And SPD managed to do this, managed to project the future of the few as the future of the many, in this case, the, the, new, the nascent industrial class, um, with the help of new media, including popular books, such as Babel's Women and Socialism, pamphlets, newspapers, social gatherings, so many uh, cultural and recreational societies, which effectively began to play out in real time the dream to come. That, that's the point I'm trying to make, that through different forms of instruments of emotional and affective purchase, the SPD managed to A, present, okay, to bring into the present um, a desirable future, and, and, and gave it that veneer of absolute desire. This is the future that I want. And so what I think we saw here in the SPD was the coming together of three political arts. Utopian invention, effective organization, unions, SPD, get, getting into the Reichstag, etc., and emotional capture. The, the second example that I want to dwell on very briefly could be described as a politics of reinventing the gender of the future. While the German example illustrates the power of, let's call it, pragmatic utopianism, the British women's movement during the 1910s I find particularly interesting because of its complete overhaul, its complete revolutionization of the instruments of politics, of, the, of political technologies. It, the overhaul of politics as a landscape, as a technology, and as a field of actors. So what do I mean by this? 
The, the women's movement at that time in the 1910s, which we remember as the suffragi suffragists or the, suff the suffrage movement, uh, the campaign for the vote, was not just about winning the vote for women. It, 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 it represented a lot more than that. But the suffrage movement was also about redefining the actors and the beneficiaries of collective life, of modern life, by, of modern living, by questioning for the very first time the public as an exclusively male arena. And by questioning the private as the arena in which women could play a more prominent but subservient or a subjugated or secondary role as keepers of the home but, uh, but not the masters of home. And I th it's, you know, the historiography on that period s shows convincingly that the, the power of the suffrage movement of that time, and it has to be seen as a phenomenal kind of example of success, came from aligning the aspirations of women as a matter of necessary and legitimate expansion of both the private world and of the public world in a modern and progressive society. And this is why I said what that movement did was it reinvented the gender of the future. And this exercise in what we call in the book reworlding as a world-making exercise but of course also required inventing new political arts precisely to disable the, the given conduct of politics. And here, to me, there are three political expansions okay, that um, are really worth uh, remind, uh, thinking of again. Political expansions that involve new political technologies that come back into the arena of embedded politics. The first is the invention of the figure of, in inverted commas, the new woman. Uh, and this happened after 1890, which helped to expand a force which until then had been fighting for the vote into one that started to campaign for radically new meanings of womanhood in the home and beyond. There were great campaigns at the time in Britain in the, in, after the 1890s uh, of campaigns of equality within the family, campaigns for the right to divorce, campaigns for the practice of sexual freedom, campaigns for the freedom of women to work and to contribute both to public and to political life. So this was a period, again, like the SPD's um, uh, use of new political technologies, this was a period of animated discussion in popular books and magazines about what it meant to be a modern woman. And of course, by and large, this was for middle-class women who could read, you know, but through popular pamphlets, these things also seeped out to women in other classes. And what we began to see as a result of the um, technologies that, that proselytized, that made a great deal out of the figure of the new woman, was, <coughs> excuse me, was a new sense of gender and gender equality. So that, that's what started to emerge in this period. So that's one political reinvention. The second one um, is the projection of the woman as a collective subject. Okay? There, there were a lot of crit de debate at the time. You know, is the suffragette movement, is the women's movement essentially for a movement for the liberation of women within the household or beyond the household? And it's at, that, at, it's at this point that um, you begin to see the political projection of the woman as collective subject, particularly in, as the campaign for women's rights in the workplace grew, linking feminism to the emerging labor and socialist movements and also bridging working women and those better off attracted by the new woman cause. So there was a new class bridge that was being constructed here between working women and uh, middle-class women who are um, interested in the, in the cause of the new woman. 
So feminism begins to expand as a cause for all women at that time. And it begins, at least on the margins, to join a broader working class struggle for equality and justice. The third expansion is a complete overhaul of the uh, tools of political expression and struggle, especially through the inventions of the Women's Social and Political Union, the WSPU, that was led by the Pankhursts. The WSPU has gone down in history, if I can use that phrase, not so much by the, the tangible achievements it's made, but by, as a result of the kind of new tools of political struggle and representation that it created. It's military-like organization, the war fatigues, for instance. It's clamorous journalism. It's open cultivation of the car, of technology, of steamship, of the banner and book as signs of being modern. It's open cultivation of songs and plays and public confrontations and prison spells and highly, highly visible protests and disturbances. And all of these things, I think, enabled new formats of agitation politics to force their way into the rules of political conduct. Pol the political and politics began to merge almost as a single kind of space of representation and clamor. And it happened, interestingly, because of this merging, with remarkable success, because it began to disarm the politics of the given. Of course, the politics of the status quo was extraordinarily strong and fought tooth and nail against the women's movement. So we couldn't, let's not romanticize what the women's movement achieved, but let's be clear that the status quo was forced to move, was forced to push. How much time do I have? Okay. So what, what I want to come now by way of a long closure <coughs> is I want to just um, offer some kind of con consider some contemporary implications of the argument that I've been making. The argument at the beginning about um, the politics of world making and the argument in the middle that there have been times in history when the left has in a sense risen to the occasion and has become actively involved in the politics of world making by reinventing the tools of politics. Now, let me say clearly and unequivocally, the kind of selective and decontextualized reading of the history of the late 19th century and the history of left political achievement is full of all the pitfalls post hoc reasoning. I completely accept that. Okay? I'm not trying to say that that was a golden period. I'm using that period in a sense to make a theoretical point. And I think if you accept my premise that we can uh, use history in that rather cavalier way, which, which is what I'm doing, then I think a general point can be made these f formative movements of the late 19th century and indeed many of the 20th century, such as mass unionism, the anti-colonial struggle without question, post-war so social democracy as well, and everything that crystallized into 1968 um, proved to be influential by design or by default because of their world-making qualities. What they did was they thoroughly changed the meaning of the political and its subjects by doing three things. Firstly, designing credible utopias and imaginaries of emancipation out of existing injuries and hidden interests, okay? of latent injuries made visible, made tangi tangible in a kind of Bruno Latourian sense. Secondly, what they managed to do was they built emotional or affective desire, what Raymond Williams would have called 
strong structures of feeling around, <coughs> um, around the new utopias. But interestingly, they did it through new technologies of representation, new technologies of combat and of identification as well. In other words, there was a kind of techno-politics of the emotion going on here, not a simple, straight kind of appeal just to the heart. And then thirdly, which is really very significant when compared to our kind of miserable present, is that they managed somehow to convert the claims into practical gains, into practical reforms, through effective organization and through effective institutionalization. Um, there is a chapter in our book that nobody has liked at all on the, on, in praise of light bureaucracy. And we can talk about that maybe in the discussion. So my argument then is that the organized left today needs to recover this capacity by making something out of the many injustices that it categorically refuses to see. And out of the many experiments of alternative society that already exist, both made visible by the protests on the streets, but also in the kind of hidden corridors of pragmatic world making when the world at large works against your interests. And we see this. Um, now, you won't be able to read any of this. We, are there any uh, printouts? Okay. So, um, the, uh, out of the many, many experiments of alternative society that already exist, as we can see from this uh, figure. Um, and what this is, is just a, an audit that we did two, three years ago when we were doing the research for this book to say, well, what's going on around the world, which we could call... Um, if you like, struggles for equality and social justice. And, and, how ma and how do these struggles for equality and social justice respond to some of the major, major contemporary challenges or, if you like, brutal developments of our time? Market fundamentalism, financialization, global inequality, climate change, climate change, climate change, and an assault on human being, particularly through the development of new technological forces. And it was really quite extraordinary. The list was just endless of the kinds of things which have been going on around in different parts of the world, in different local communities. So just in the area of financialization, you know, and which seems to be the most uh, relevant topic to talk about at the moment, um, there are exa countless examples of socially enabling forms of credit and money, microcredit in the third world, for example. The rise of ethical pension funds, or pension funds made slightly more ethical, and, and linked with that ethical investment. Um, new forms of social accounting, which are coming into being, um, not, getting, uh, not being used, that I have to say, within the corporate world, but it, within kind of alternative, smaller um, economies, social accounting, is an extremely important way of allocating rare and scarce resource. The introduction of circuit breakers in order to slow down transactions, for instance, so that the fast movement of finance capital can be slowed down for us to be able to see what exactly is going on um, in the kind of allocations of money that, that, that come about. Uh, of course, standard things like uh, renationalizing the banks, um, en entering into risk sharing, um, um, absolute financial transparency, limits to pay differentials and dividends. But what's, uh, what's interesting is in the current critique of the financial meltdown, just about the only thing that the left can think about is bring back, you know, reduce the bonuses and the dividends that the, the financial bosses have. When in fact, the array of possibility in slowing down, rethinking, finance and re-ethicizing finance are immense, are just immense. And you know, these are concrete examples from all over the world. And exactly the same sort of thing can be said about 
um, contemporary experiments, experiments of living with and combating um, the in enormous increase in global inequality. The Tobin tax, women's empowerment, alternative trading blocks, and a whole series of things which um, I won't labor the point, but I leave to you at your leisure to look, to look at that list, and of course we can discuss this in, in, the, in the discussion. The left could make these experiments absolutely its cause. The organized left could do this. It could gather all of these experiments under the single umbrella of a continually expanding, fair, and just society. Now, I recognize, of course, that this is in many ways an un unwieldy and imprecise kind of politics. It doesn't lend itself to the eye-catching slogans, the, the gut reaction, the visceral appeals, and the programmatic audits that are the stuff of contemporary posture politics, which has come to dominate the political field. It's also, I accept, an extraordinarily broad and shifting agenda of causes and progressive experiments. Though why should this be a problem for the left? I don't really understand. Often the left says, we need to have a single clear message in order to get our message across. And I don't understand how it's not possible for the official left to say, we stand for a thousand types of different forms of justice and equality um, addressed through a politics of five principal concerns, market fundamentalism, financialization, and so on and so forth. But things could be different, indeed, if the left decided to focus, I think, on the arts of amplification and traction. Like its forebears, like its, its, its predecessors in the past, there is no reason why the organized left could not commit to transforming the very field of politics in ways that disarm ex um, embedded expectations and routines. The left could itself attend to the arts of transformative politics and in ways that alter the public's understanding of itself and of the society to come. I don't think this is a matter of visualizing the house on the hill and mapping in detail the journey towards it. But I think instead it's one of building tools, political technologies, that can show that the kinds of experiments that I mentioned that are up there are actually the foothills of a, <coughs> excuse me, the foothills of a world that the many, not just the few, wish to belong to. The challenge then, I think, becomes one of building resonance around and across the diverse struggles and causes of the fair and the equal society in almost a kind of machinic way. And I'm, I'm, I'm referring here to Bill Connolly's wonderful book on machinic politics. By doing what? By working on such things as disclosure, Contagion, okay? making things contagious, making new desires spread through society, through organization, through innovation. And some of the details of what, what I mean by this in the context of the five global challenges that I mentioned are shown in this final figure. In the area of financialization, a politics of disclosing that actually the world of finance is a world of multiple networks of funding and, and, um, and allocation, of exposing, yes, a politics of exaggerated salaries and bonuses, of finding new ways of tra tracking and developing market sentiments so that ethical feelings come back into the world of finance. And co in contrary to that, of, of dissipating, of getting rid of, 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 of showing, if you like, the displeasures, the, the damages of dissipating greed and instant gratification that instant finance seems to support. By building in all kinds of filters, I want contagion here, um, for example, positive panics, not negative panics on currencies, but positive panics when 
in fact, currencies are causing an enormous amount of damage, of amplifying the kind of damage that's caused. Of course, press regulation, intense press regulation to stop panics and booms and busts. And in the field of organization, why not a politics, sustained politics of insisting on global regulatory structures, of antitrust, um, and effort absolutely to break up the banks. And around in innovation, well, the list is there already. Making more of new forms of currency, making a lot more of new market and regulatory structures. Yes, nationalization, why not? And again, I think the same kind of thing can be said about global inequality. But I won't go into that because my time is running out. So let me come to a conclusion. The, the sum of this kind of politics of amplification or traction, if you want to call it, I think would be the gradual alteration of the landscape of political opinion political expectation, and political practice. So much more would be added into what we chose to call the game of politics that the contemporary politics of the few, for the few, would start looking deficient, would start looking as obviously unfair. Be precisely because the left, the organized and the, uh, the grassroots left would have worked on the substance of another society, on the substance of, a, of society, of the social transformed. It would have worked on the structures of feeling of another society, mainstream feelings such as fairness, autonomy, labor, heterogeneity, accomplishment as an ethical goal, and it would have worked on the sites of the amplification of these new structures of feeling in the arena of broadcasting, film, in playgrounds, in public gatherings, in websites, in chat rooms, in newsrooms, in music venues, theaters, exhibitions, broadsheets, and the rest, the kind of things that this organization does. And it would have worked on technologies to visualize the hidden and also the possible such as new forms of mapping and such as new forms of performative art as politics. And it would have worked finally on campaigns to expose, systematically expose corporate power, state brutality and media manipulation. It would have worked on the bureaucracies, the light bureaucracies and the, the legal arena in which the victories of the fair society can actually be sustained then I think what might happen is that the contents of a new manifesto that we're beginning to see in Europe or in some areas of Europe for such things as income distribution, collective ownership, public goods, the commons, the social state, market controls, basic income, social enterprise, job sharing, these sorts of things um, would finally would begin to make sense to a public that's been warmed up. At the moment, these alternatives of another society, the contents, make no sense to anybody, and that's a, that's a tragedy. And they make no sense to anybody because I think the left has stopped being a world-making force, doing the kind of things that I've been trying to cover in my talk. The left veritably could lead in opening up the political, in working with protest movements on the arts that are needed to make visible and make tangible another way of living that begins to be seen by the public as natural and as desirable um, so that these reforms acquire the politics of head and heart. At the moment, the, the left does not come anywhere close to the heart. Otherwise, the promises and failures of existing regimes and existing modes of being in the world, neoliberal, catastrophist, authoritarian, consumerist, and individualist, will continue to resonate 
as nothing other than normal. I'll stop there. Thank you very much for your very inspiring uh, lecture. Now the floor is for our participants. Who will start? You are the first. Um, what, I, what I wanted to ask first, everything you, you were telling us in the last five minutes, so I ask you, why does this not happen? No, because some 20 years ago, 25 years ago, in all over Europe, we rather had social democratic governments. In Italy, Craxi, in, in, uh, in Portugal, Brandt, uh, the Scandinavian countries, Blair, and so on. So why did these people turn to a really right-wing and pro-capitalistic and privatization direction and not exactly to every, every one of these points you, pu you put out. And I'm sorry to say, it would be very interesting for me to say, to, to know from, Mr. Ha from, from you, Mr. Hauser, why you did, to my view, the same thing nowadays. Said, uh, said, why it is not is it a lack of knowledge? Is it a, a, a lack of, of how to do things? Or is it an involvement into the, into the leadership, going away from the social leadership, turning to a more individualized leadership with, with, which has nothing to do with, with any social identification? And, uh, and the second question I, I would have, for you, who is, who is really the subject, the progressive subject in, in Europe at least now? Because does it come out as a proletarians or as a women, women lip movement? From the productional process, that means you have a, a change of, of technolo technology, a new formation, and so a new group of people is emerging as his proletarian workers did? Or is it rather a political, political uh, led group? Or is it a, a global, uh, out, coming out from globalization as uh, the poor third world or Africa? Who is the subject now to these people who, who come and try to, to go over, over the Mediterranean? What do you think, who is it? This one. Um. <laughs> Thank you, those are two big and tough questions. I, I, I think just on the first one, and I would like uh, Professor Hausner to offer a view as well. So why has the left given up? Um, I, I think there are a number of reasons. One which would be consistent with the, the, my book is that the left found itself almost caught unawares by a visceral politics of acquisition of money, of self-betterment, of individualism. And in a way, I think the greatest achievement of neoliberal politics was that it made that politics almost into a kind of natural politics of desire. And, and for a very, very short period, um, the historic left in Europe, the Social Democrats, were kind of caught out by that and didn't offer a robust institutional and political and ideological response to it, but did so by saying, look, there are some old values that we need to still continue to retain. Neoliberalism is against an old form of social democracy. And I think the public and the electorate wanted to hear a kind of new discourse, okay? Which is why I'm talking about making a world-making type of politics, that a politics of defending the past became almost untenable because the right was able to de describe that past as tainted, as corrupt, as, as, as bureaucratic, as, as, as the kind of politics that left, that excluded more than it included. So that's one reason that, that I would modestly offer, okay. I think the other reason was that, um, and I don't have a proper explanation for this, 
but I think the official left became complacent. You know, it kind of stopped thinking in many ways. But certainly in the British context, um, the thinking that Blair did under New Labour was new thinking. It wasn't old thinking. But the new thinking that was done by Blair's kitchen cabinet was we must, have, we must make a new politics much more market friendly, much more individualist, much more neoliberal, because some of the great victories of Thatcherism cannot simply be denied. And so it became a kind of newness of preservation rather than a, 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 an, a, an agenda for radical reform. The third thing and final thing I'll say on that was that in many ways, the left found itself almost, or the official left, the parties of the left, found, found themselves without a movement. Okay? Um, partly because of the collapse of unions, certainly in, in, in my part of the world, the, the civic movements, in a sense, were beginning to fragment a lot more, were becoming more neighborhood-based, were becoming less and less political and politicized, and so the left they lo lost an interlocutor, l lost a series of partners that, for that would have forced it to become a new kind of a world-making force. Okay? And it became, therefore, an isolated reactionary force. Which brings me to your, to your second question. Um, who, who, who is the progressive subject of the present? Um, I think the progressive subject of the present, and I kind of half agree with the Hart and Negri thesis here, is an ill-defined precariat. Um, there's a whole series of social actors, young people in particular, who in a sense have no hope in the labor market, in the educational market. A whole series of, if you like, migrant, non-regularized, black economy, workers who will always, always remain as part of the salaried precariat. A whole generation of people who will never ever get into the housing market to, of ownership in particular, but um, uh, also low, I mean, rented housing sector. So a kind of a whole mass, in a sense, I'm, I'm with the Occupy movement on, on the, the 99%, okay, that actually some 99% of society finds itself somehow on the outside of an incredibly kind of elite-driven, corporatist and corporatized world. Now, the moment in which you acknowledge the 99%, there, therein, I think, begin our problems, okay, because that 99% is an extremely heterogeneous 99%. Um, so, is a politics of left future world making, could it be enacted around the figure of the precariat? Where the overall ambition, in a sense, is to eliminate the figure of the precariat, regardless of who, in historical time and space, that precariat is. I pose it as a question because I don't have an answer, but I would kind of, my thinking would go in that direction. Um, and then finally, I'd also say that, of course, and in, we in the left have been utterly, si have singularly failed at this. We've not made the environment a subject itself, you know, a, a kind of the preservation of the environment and how we will learn to live in kind of better ways with a diminishing, quite literally a diminishing globe um, in new ways. And so, you know, coming out of the eco left ecology movement, might it be possible that the subject of the future is the earth itself? And so like these kind of two subjectivities of the precariat and the, of the, and the earth itself, could that march forward as a, as, a, as a possible new policy? Because for sure the right is not interested in these two things. I mean, in, in, in any sense of the word. <coughs> I have no general answer, but uh, you ask me personally, uh, regarding my responsibility, and as I guess you refer to my period of activity as a member of a cabinet, of a left-wing cabinet of Leszek Miller, uh, Miller and then also in Marek Belka cabinet. Let me remind, uh, 2001, when I became a Minister of Labor and Social Policy, 
unemployment rate at the level of more than 20% and more than 3 million people registered in our, in, in our labor offices. Rate of growth at the level of zero, a very high budget deficit, and uh, fastly growing debt to GDP. Uh, with the danger of, of, of default, of general default, and all everything in the front of EU accession. In two years, we, have, we are approaching EU accession. And I think that this is a real responsibility. It's not a discussion. It's a real uh, governmental work. Then you may assess how we change the situation in this period. But even you say and I will not agree that I followed the line of predecessors. It's not true. My way of thinking about the improvement of financial standing of my, our state and my way of dealing with unemployment and also my way of dealing with rate of growth was not the Balcerovich way. I have no time to prove it because it will take too much time and Ashamin is a guest and not myself. But even you will not accept the, those arguments that I was thinking in another way. I would like to remind you, at least three of my inventions, the law on public benefit and the general openness to civil society through this law. It was my personal initiative. And I proposed this law to the parliament. And it was passed because of my activity. I would like to remind you, as series of actions regarding social economy. And the basis of the social economy was built during my term. And also I, will, I would like to remind you my openness to social dialogue, and not only within the tripartite commission. The position of the commission was much stronger than ever, but also the openness to new forms of civil dialogue. So I... I wouldn't like to put aside your critic. You are, not, you are not the only person who say it. But I have some arguments which allow me to say that I, I feel as a person who has left sympathy. Now I'm not involved in a politics because I'm a member of a monetary policy council. We are not allowed to take any political actions. And that's all what I would like to say during the lecture, which is not on my activity, but I am open to take a risk to discuss with all of you about this period of uh, governmental policy. Do you, really think, do you really think that if Zapatero was a chancellor of Germany, Germany would like much better than after the Gerhard Schroeder period? Are you, really, are you really claim that Zapatero policy would be better for Germany and the position of Germany, economic position? Um, just to reclaim the mic. I, I think there is one very significant difference between the, the turn of the last century, the 60s and the 70s, and the 80s and the 90s. And that difference lies in the degree to which politics within the confines of the nation state is free to do what it feels like doing. Um, you know, and loosely speaking, because of globalization, you know, the thorough integration of markets, the rise of corporate power on a global scale, um, the rise of a, of a, of a kind of stockholder, uh, democracy or, or its opposite. I think these things have reduced um, the, the, the breathing space um, for national-based politics. And it reduced the, the time, I think, for those politicians genuinely on the left at that time who wanted to preserve social democracy to take a stance, to make a stance, in a sense to begin to engage in a new kind of world-making politics. I think that was the very big difference. You know, so I don't think this discussion should be about 
the hearts and minds and ambitions of particular politicians and particular polit political groups, but the space in which those political freedoms could be um, uh, dialogically debated with the public when, in a sense, behind, behind the closed door, there was a counter-politics of push coming from international corporations, from integrated financial inst institutions, and so on. So I think the room for maneuver in the here and now of making a new kind of politics, I think closed down quite quickly in the 80s and the 90s. So, uh, Professor, I mean, not to take issue with your selective use, use of history, but just to, to take a historical perspective anyway, uh, and perhaps just to drag a dead body into the issue here, but it seems to me in terms of the issues of the organized left, the radical left, um, that the, one of the things hanging over the current situation is, is communism, right? The Communist Party, uh, which in terms of world-making really took, you know, a discursive monopoly uh, uh, of, of that, which makes it very difficult for, uh, well, I think it's something that the really grassroots democratic movements are still reacting against, uh, and also something that makes it difficult for the organized um, political parties to, to take up that kind of... Uh, that kind of attitude. Um, so basically my question is, to what extent is that a legacy that still needs to be dealt with and you know, put into the grave, basically, um, by, by the left? Or, or, or to what extent is it simply an issue that we have basically moved beyond in its history and we just need to move forward into something else? Um, I think it's, um, it's a kind of dead dog that's in the grave now. Um, may or may not try and resurge. The kind of Russian-Ukraine developments right now are emblematic of the dead dog kind of waking up or wagging an ear every now and then to fairly devastating effect. But I think a general point can be made from your very prescient, obs prescient observation, which is that, the, for me, a world-making force is one that never looks and turns back that is in a, in a constant state of agitation about how to make a different kind of future from the one that we know and the one that we've known in the past. And in that regard, the kind of living communist legacy, I, I, can't, I find no other way of saying it than to say that it was a complete travesty of itself. Professor, um uh, I just had to, I've just had to rephrase my question because when you, when you said, of course, press regulation to uh, prevent panics and booms, I, 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 was, I, I thought I may have misheard or I hallucinated and I wanted to ask you if, uh, if that was indeed the case, but I can see now that it's on, the, it's on the list behind you. So now I understand that in your view, freedom of speech is subordinate or ought to be subordinate to a government's economic policy. Um, I just wanted to ask uh, if I, I assume that this is uh, this is a list of actions of political arts that you have presented uh, to many forums, and I just wanted to ask if what kind of reactions you do you meet with when you present this idea that uh, freedom of expression is less important than smoothing the business cycle. Thank you. Um, I don't think that's what I'm saying. Um, okay, I mean, you picked on one specific example amidst a, a range of different examples, and in a sense, my argument is a kind of symbolic and an emblematic one. And the whole purpose of the exercise is to say that a functioning, progressive, future-oriented left will have to look at different ways in which it can begin to provide an institutional backcloth to the sorts of demands that, if you like, those people on the ground desire and crave for a counter politics and to make it tangible. Um, if that on occasion requires some degree of this beast called the organized left reigning in corporate power in the way that effective antitrust has tried to do in the history of regulation of the economy, then that's no bad thing. 
I'm not really saying, and I really would you know, I urge you to accept that, I'm not saying that this should be a kind of wholesale lockdown on the freedoms of the press or the freedom of speech. I'd be insane to make that kind of argument. And since you asked the question, how else has my talk been received elsewhere, effectively it's been received through a measure of interest, through some excitement, and through some disappointment. I mean, that's the nature of intellectual exchange, surely. I would like to ask about, uh, let's say, new leftist formations, because when we are speaking about organized uh, politics, very often people who are struggling for new conditions of the world are, are a little bit uh, disappointed with old formations, let's say. And many eyes at the moment are, um, are looking towards, for example, the Greek Caesar, a new kind, let's say, of leftist uh, formation that emerged out of, uh, of anti-globalist struggles in the 90s and recently absorbed many of the agendas and the practices of the revolutionary movement f movements from 2011. And it seems that they have a big, serious chance to, to win the parliamentary elections in Greece. And I would like to ask you whether you have any uh, comment on formations like, like CISA, for example, the new leftist formations in, uh, on the scene of Europe. Yeah, no, I mean, I think if CISA gets into power, it would be an extraordinarily good thing. And, um, I mean, in, in many ways you could argue that the, the current state or um, disarray of electoral politics in Greece provides that kind of opening and, I hope it works in favor of Syriza rather than New Dawn, you know, um, the Golden Dawn. Uh, and that's part of the problematic here, that um, in the case of Greece, because of the enormity of change, and almost overnight, over a two to three year period, in a sense, everything was caught with its clothes down, clothes down you know. So disorganized politics became organized politics and, and vice versa, and there was no kind of as it were, established left, which was there, that could have reinvented itself. So for that kind of particular politics of place, um, what you allude to, I think, to me, is, can, can, can only be seen as a good and a positive thing. And I hope that happens, and in such a way that once in Parliament, the effective reforms that are necessary to stabilize Greek economy and society can be made. Uh, oh. Egypt, sorry, but, you know, Egypt, elsewhere, um, Turkey, other situations in which if you've got uh, an enormous amount of ground volatility doesn't necessarily produce the kinds of progressive political outcomes that may, may come to pass in Greece. And in many ways, those are the kind of the concerns of my thinking and my talk and my book at the moment. That, you know, if it is kicking off almost everywhere and where the outcomes of the kicking off are fragile indeed, and in some certain places there is a, I wouldn't call it a willing, but let's call it an available, organized or embedded left, wouldn't it be a good thing if that left woke up as well? I think that's the gist of what my argument is. I was a bit late, so maybe uh, my question would be uh, based on uh, misinterpretation, misreading of, of your speech. Uh, but I have like two important questions, but they need to be put in a, a broader context. Uh, because I, um, I believe that uh, you were saying, uh, you, were, you, were, you were talking about um, the techniques of change and not about the conditions. And I would like to refer um, to the debate about who is making actually progress. A uh, debate that I was thinking about uh, after reading some essays by uh, Liba thinker Tony Jad. And uh, initially I strongly disagreed with uh, his thesis that it was actually liberals that make all the uh, uh, reforms and not the leftists. Uh, but then after a while, um, I came to my own conclusion that um, the conditions of, 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 of progress are conditions of paying the devil. And uh, the progress uh, 
can be achieved when those in power uh, feel that they have to pay the devil somehow to contain, uh, well, you know, to, to contain uh, the, the, the bad feelings in society. And um, the problem is that um, if you look at, uh, at uh, achievements that, that you were talking about, um, that uh, we are in the situations that uh, there is no longer there is no longer a big attractive devil that has to be paid. That is uh, the communist empire. So uh, we can see that there is devil that has to be paid, and this is uh, the um, vision of ecological catastrophe. But uh, um, are we as organized? Uh, we the the precariat to be seen as the devil that has to be paid, or are we uh, still um, too fragile? And this, and this is the first question. Where are the devils that can be used by us uh, through those old techniques of mobilization uh, that, could be, that could lead to progress? And the other question is that um, uh, I missed the, 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 the part about uh, um, the, 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 the success of Espada. But um, as I was uh, questioning my friends here in back rows, it seems that um, you have not mentioned that, um, that the broader colonial uh, context. And um, my question would be um, um, so, some, somewhat like this. Uh, if it can be argued that um, the progress in Europe is somehow related to sort of outsourcing of inequality, to the other parts of the world. Where can we outsource inequality now? Uh, because uh, it used to be outsourced, of course, um, uh, also um, to other species, right? But now we know that this leads to, uh, to the ecological catastrophe. So uh, where can we outsource uh, inequality now? Okay, that's great. <laughs> Those are two um, really very interesting questions and, and kind of provoca provocations. Um, I'm not sure I, I can do justice to your questions, but let me just try my best, okay? So on, on your first question, which is about uh, paying the devil and is the precariat too fragile a, a devil today? Who is the devil today? I, my answer is yes and no, okay? I think the precariat is, at one level, without question, too fragile a devil because it doesn't have the corporate muscle or power that, let's say, the international banking, banking system has. No question about that. And in any case, I think it's also true, particularly in Europe, given the way in which the labor market and societal rewards are structured, you know, the precariat is no longer even a surplus labor force anymore. It's not even required for that reason. So let the precariat fester. On the other hand, and this is my kind of yes-no answer, on the other hand, if the size of the precariat grows to the point that it becomes permanently and viscerally disenfranchised, at a time in which populations are increasingly concentrated in cities, right? so for instance, all over the world, by 2030 or by 2050, something like 70 to 75 percent, that's something like 6 billion people, will be concentrated in 300, 400, 600, 800 cities around the world. You know, this combination of the size of the precariat growing and its urban concentration in those cities in which, in a sense, there is no hope and nothing is provided, nothing is produced. You know, it could almost produce the kind of, almost a kind of medieval revolt of the pre precariat. Nobody could anticipate the timing of it or what, what shape it will take. But that precariat, concentrated in numbers, um, I mean, just another thought, you know, and this is not a European thing. But of the unborn three billion between now and 2030 or 2050, all the forecasts propose suggest 
that something like 90 to 98 percent of those unborn three billion will be living in the slums of the world. So imagine what happens, the, the nature of politics, when the precariat, in a sense, takes on that form. Um, if that's not the elephant in the room, I don't know what is. Okay? Um, I really don't know what is. And then, so that brings me to your second question, um, the outsourcing of inequality. And it's a really fantastic observation then. And you could turn the question on its head, okay? In a completely networked post-territorial world, um, might it not then be, case, be the case that the room for the outsourcing of inequality has more or less disappeared? And the evidence, you know, from the kind of <laughs> the, the, the Piketty book through all these other great tracts that, that we're beginning to find on inequality at the moment, or the geography of inequality, that the geography of inequality is now as much at home as it is abroad, right? At home being the kind of European heartlands or how, how Europe likes to think of itself. And so I kind of think that partly because of matters of the geography of social organization and the connectivity of things, and if you like, the implosion, the breakdown of territorial, the territorial boundedness of society, the option of the outsourcing of inequality, I think, is beginning to disappear. And in, so one of the consequences of that, therefore, then is that then the counter politics of the precariat or those who uh, oppose inequality um, is one that is uniquely at home. So, question. When does that kind of counter politics then take on the form that it, and why does it take on the form that it has in the, say, the new Latin American dawn, you know, post decolonization, 10 years of kind of almost radical democratic surge in the Latin American countries and no such equivalent has happened in, in the European heartland. What was going on in Latin America at that time? Was, that, was the process of outsourcing effectively not outsourcing, but in saying actually we're outsourcing ourselves from our terrible past? Do you see what I'm getting at here? That there are kind of histories of space and histories of history here which, which need to be brought into our framing of where the outside lies, where and, what, and what's the composition of the inside. And I think a kind of the politics of outsourcing in the way that you brilliantly described, I think is no longer feasible, actually. We had like two questions. Uh, I think that, uh, it is a, a great idea that you join affect here because uh, usually uh, when politics is talked about, people talk about interests, pe people talk about solutions, uh, but I think that something is lacking here for me. When, uh, when I uh, read about this affect, you, you talk about mobilizing affect uh, and there's nothing about conflict. I think that this is kind of affect that, that, we, that is really uh, that is hindering the possibility of mobilizing affect. That for, and uh, conflict, I mean, uh, I mean uh, various, uh, various fields of domination which are uh, in, not, not somewhere else, but which are in the, uh, those groups that are supposed to, uh, to be against inequality. Like, for example, well, something that... Uh, I can, I can say from my personal perspective, I know many men who, who certainly are uh, for the equality of women. They, they, uh, they agree with it completely, but on the other hand, it's quite natural to them. For, uh, for example, in many situations, that their position is higher. Than, for example, they, they, their opinion counts more, that they, they have a right to, to silence a woman. Yes? And there are many plans, like, for example, there are people who are less educated, who are not so fashionable, yes? and also their opinion counts less. So, uh, well, who's affect? Yes? So, so, so this is, uh, uh, of course, we can argue that uh, equality is better for everyone. Yes, Th there is this great argument, but uh, that's in the long run. And in the short run, losing privil privilege brings a lot of affect, but it's negative affect. And to both sides, because, uh, well, when, when we say, well, we are friends, yes, we have a common aim, we are fighting inequality, and then somebody says, well, but I am marginalized here. 
then it, it raises a lot of negative effects for, for everybody. And uh, I think that this is, uh, this is a very uh, difficult, uh, difficult point in this, uh, in this uh, part of, of affect, of, uh, uh, in, in this table here. So that's what I want to say. There is a, uh, <coughs> there, there is a the, the, the epilogue of the book is, <laughs> it goes back to Raymond Williams. And it, and it kind of leaves this territory of the affect of particular issues and causes, which are absolutely divisive. I completely agree with you. And it goes back to um, how might it be possible for progressive movements to cultivate a kind of growing sense of positive affects, of, of, okay? um, positive structures of feeling. Um, you know, and I just touched on them very fleetingly at the end, you know, such things as the, the, the crafting properties of labor properly, properly conducted or the, kind of cra the effects of fairness or, or whatever. So why end up with a, why close a book on the politics of affect for some reasons, okay? One is that the left has taken affect as given. Okay. And, and it does not engage anymore in, in the, I'll use this word, in the engineering of affect, in the way that the right does so effectively, one. Two, it seems to me that, that we are surrounded by negative affect at the moment, that in many ways the, kind of, the, the world hovers around and the divisions in the world hover around a whole series of negative affects, which produces so many us's versus them that at least for a little sm tiny moment, it might be worth thinking about a new kind of commons which is constructed around shared emotions of the so-called good society. Now, I, I, know, I understand this sounds very woolly and soft, but I stand by it, actually, okay? Um, because I think, in a sense, that our times demand um, at least the labor or the effort to think about how negative affects can be channeled into certain po positive Goals and gains which are for the many and not the few. And I think the third point I would make is that, of course it goes without saying, that this kind of a politics, which requires a, a connection between the different sites of the political, the green movement, the women's movement, the labor movement, uh, the, the kids' movement, uh, and official politics as we know it, can only be a deliberative, discursive, agonistic arena. It, it has to be. It cannot be anything other than riddled with conflict. But at least it's, it becomes a form of agonism which has purpose, which is channeled and then produces temporary generalized agreements. Temporary generalized agreements, which will be changed again tomorrow, without question, because that's the nature of a, a democratic polity. Okay. So in the schema of things, um, I, I, I wouldn't want to you to w walk away and think that actually this guy was arguing against agonistic politics and for a kind of politics of love thy neighbor. In fact, I've kind of written vehemently against the politics of love thy neighbor. But what I'm looking for is a way in which agonism can temporarily be channeled around the kind of politics of the commons, which requires particular shared affects. Uh, thank you. Um, I very much, I found in fact your talk very, very fascinating. I've been a, a member of the Labour, British Labour Party for around 50 years and I can see precisely what you were talking about in terms of the invisceration uh, of the party. It's been, and it's continuing by the way. Uh, one of the questions I would ask of course on a personal level, if I, I, I've got so much emotional capital invested in the Labour Party, as many of us do have, which other party do you suggest I join to support. But more to the point, part of that invisceration was due to a functionalist view of organization. That is the growth of what we called a few years ago managerialism, which was accepted by people, in which you hear all that, if only we had a good manager, if, you know, if there's a one person who can do it. In other words, po uh, democracy itself, the ability to achieve things through groups, uh, through a group of people, has itself been denied. We even see that in the process at the present time with the cooperative movement in the UK. The second point I'd like to make 
is that um, is not part of the problem that we in the West particularly are very comfortable. We are very comfortable. We in fact are enjoying uh, the success of social democracy. Um, and until perhaps we start seeing that shredding more and more and more, we will not get the rise of a effective alternative politics. Uh, the final point I want to make is that you were very despondent. You say you could not achieve success through alternative politics. May I suggest that is not strictly correct? Uh, the first reason, if we take your Tobin tax, after an agitation of two or three years, we have the financial transaction tax. If you take the environmental issues, we now have widespread acceptance of the need for climate change. Now, of course, the process itself is clearly difficult, it's subject to interest, but the objectives are accepted. So change has happened, uh, and the 99% uh, thing has also been generally accepted, and it is in process. Uh, th thank you for those comments. Let, as time is running on, let me try and respond very briefly, if you don't mind. Um, w which party should you join in the British context? Um, I haven't got a clue. And, and, and I say that with deep regret, because Dito, my history is one of the Labour Party. Um, Ken Loach's new party is an interesting one. Um, what are they called? Uh, the Real Socialists or something? Um, it's a broad church organization, the principles of which are really quite fascinating. It'll go nowhere, of course. Um, so un until that point, stick to labor, I think. Uh, your second point about that managerialism has substituted democracy, you've hit the nail on the head. I completely, completely agree. And in fact, um, that, was, that was the Blairite tragedy, I think. That said, I think it is quite interesting and it's important that the gains of democracy do also need to be institutionalized and need to somehow be made bureaucratically light and tangible and available. Mm -hmm. And I think in that regard, some of the achievements in the European Union over the last 20 to 30 years have been spectacularly successful. So there's, this, there's always this kind of tense relationship between uh, managerialism and democracy. Um, so they are like warring cousins, I think. Um, maybe your third point, it may be. Uh, I am, however, really quite surprised that I mean, the, the economic meltdown in Europe started in 2008, and the, the hidden results are pervasive. They're not visible results. So I'm just, I'd pose a counter question. Is the problem here the absence of breakdown or its invisibility. Um, certainly in the UK context, I mean, if you stack up all the, the bads, hmm? lack of access to housing, lack of access to jobs, university fees, uh, a precariat, the likes of which the country has never, ever seen. Um, I mean, all, all sorts of things. A north that's getting bigger and bigger because the South is only London now. All these things um, have produced, I think, a vast set of injuries in, in, within the confines of the closed home, the neighborhood, the bankrupt city in the North. And it doesn't quite stack up. In a sense, this is, the problem is the politics of visualization. And the media here has been enormously responsible, irresponsible in not actually joining up the dots, and not making the invisible, visible. So that, that would be my kind of observation on your third point. And then finally, um, yes, yes, I do agree. Of course I agree. And I think the, my, the gist of my argument is not so much occupy or official left, but that these two have to go together hand in glove. The history of all reform is the history of protest from below. I mean, of course, of course it is. On the other hand, when those kind of protests from below convert into, for a few years at least, 
such things as universal welfare or Tobin, then that's a good thing. And that kind of requires, I think, um, this, this, this uh, organic, healthy relationship between the grassroots and top down. That's the last question. Thank you so much for your talk, Professor Amin. And I have a question, because it remained a bit unclear to me. Uh, could you say, uh, tell us a bit more about the relationship between the high politics, you know, the Labour Party, the, the leftist official institutions, um, the, the so-called established left, and the social movements or the grassroots organizations? Because it seems that this relationship was clearly articulated in your talk. However, you didn't really conceptualize that. And I was wondering how you know, I think that this is really necessary for us to understand how the precariat can, can become a truly political subject, a truly collective political subject. Because as you said, it seems that it is already now imminently there, the precariat. It just has to somehow become this political subject. And it seems that the underlying current of your talk suggests that you know, it can become a political subject by joining or somehow working, collaborating with the official left. So I was just wondering if you could Tell us something more on, on that issue, thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I mean, I, th I think um, I'll keep it brief, but let me start at what I would call the beginning. And I think the beginning here is the observation that I started out at the start of the paper, which is why have the institutions of the organized left, however you define it, been so averse, so blind, and so negative towards grassroots politics. And so part of my argument is that until that dialogue is, occurs, until the official left, which in a sense has the resource and capacity to influence and make things stick, particularly through electoral politics or through bureaucratic access in, say, municipal government or whatever. Until that happens, then I don't think the, the many fantastic, wonderful demands that, that you see from grassroots politics, from social movements, are able to convert. So it's a, it's a really kind, kind of, it's quite a small functionalist, technocratic point, okay? And it's about the politics of con conversion. Because until sympathetic organizations from within something called the organized left are able to respond to, to pick up on things that are happen at grassroots level. There will be no politics of amplification and traction, which is what I was trying to get at in my talk and also um, in the book. Such simple things as, you know, successful legal reform hmm, on whatever. And then secondly and, 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 and finally, um, the, the issue here, and it's, this is not an answer, it's just an observation. The issue here for me is, is about rekindling or re, reinventing a mode through which all the countercurrents that we see could in a sense be brought into a, a, a kind of consistent, fighting, transformative political project. And I just pose it as a question, is that possible? Is that possible, if you like, without a kind of bigger picture politics? Uh, many in the room would say, of course it's possible. My view is, I don't think it is. We are coming to close this session, and I would like, on behalf of the whole participants, to express uh, our gratitude for your coming and for your inspired lecture, and let me also add my personal uh, thanks to you, because listening to you, I feel that I know more, but I feel also that I have more energy to change the world. Thank you very much for your coming.